feel like Bruce Buffer just told me it's time. History! Oh! UFC history! The Pittsburgh Steelers have won the Super Bowl for a sixth time. DC. I uh, just asked you about why you're late, bro. You have to be professional. <laughs> we are now joined <laughs> by the oh. greatest. Oh. DC, you broke my heart. DC always hates on you on this show. This country, where are you get from? This country, get, look at this country bumpkin eating frog legs. <laughs> <laughs> So now what? After you and I put together in the face, we go sit back down and play chess. Get hey, I'm DC, two division champ. I, I, I ran the UFC. Appreciate you, boys. Look around. Look what I'm rolling around in, too. Don't forget. Ooh, I see. DC, you ain't got one of those. Wait, that's your car? I'm uncomfortable right now. My abs like secondhand embarrassment. So to get an opportunity to be with one of the greats talking about a great sport, you can't beat that. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my friend Ryan Clark. And Ryan Clark, you know how much I love the opening animation. I think they're ready for a show. Oh, oh. We love that. Like, we love the opening animation. And yeah. want to tell you guys that the person that made its name is Gonzo, Alex Gonzalez. But not only are we taking the sport serious at ESPN, we are really taking the sport serious. As look at my man Gonzo made his Muay Thai debut last weekend and won RC, won his Muay Thai amateur fight for the first time. So congrats to Gonzo. Hey, man, congrats to you, brother. At DC and RC, all we do is win, 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 no matter what. And our dog Gonzo gets his first win in his first amateur fight. We are proud of you, brother. Not only is the animation on fire, but now you're on fire inside the ring. And DC... Man, I know you got some stuff to do, like some housekeeping, right? To make sure people know what's up in the show. But I've done yeah, some yeah, research. Yeah, 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 yeah. A couple okay. of weeks ago, you said this about a field goal that you made at the Saints facility. Won't you take a look at <laughs> this? One time I was at the Saints facility, and I kicked a 47-yard field goal. And I was surprised because I made it. So for Pajeda to actually be jumping up and down, Tells me that he surprised himself. So I don't know if he's ever done that before. He was just lucky enough to get it on camera. Because when I kicked that DC. field goal, I kind of celebrated like I had I, I surprised myself. What, Ryan? What, Ryan? You see, you kicked a 47-yard field goal. 47-yard field goal. 47 yards, Pete. DC. 40, 47 DC. yard field goal. Ash on P. <laughs> he was there. Well, so there. you lied, DC. Oh. Here, we're going to count it up. <laughs> That's 10 yards. That is also 10 yards. The end zone is, is no, also 10 no. yards, which gives you a 30-yard field goal. It's 30 yards, no, DC. No, no, no. And I looked at the video. <laughs> no. No, DC, you owe me money. You owe me money because you said it was 42 yards. Well, you said 47 first, and then we went to 42. It's only 30 yards, DC. Oh. That's, Man, that's DC. Crap. That's crap. That is crap. That. The it's, footage has been edited. The footage has been edited. Something's been done to my video. I promise you, that ball traveled much further. The first when I had no, that video initially, the ball traveled much further. What did you guys do to that video? I'm so surprised. DC, How did you guys DC, do that? Nobody. Nobody doctored the video, bro. You kicked it from the 20 what? yard line, which is a oh 30 yard field goal. Where did you? Where did you add the other 17 yards from, though? That's all I want to know. Where did you get them from? Wait, it's, that's all I want to know. Wait a minute. Bro, I'm like, I'm literally, like, dumbfounded as to what y'all did with the video. How did y'all do that with the video, dog? How did y'all do that? I don't know. That's what I'm talking about, working I don't know if corporate. They backstabbing me. I don't know if corporate Jake can get on the God mic and tell you that he didn't do anything. Maybe it's too early for him to tap oh in and get in on this. Bro. It's 10 yards. That's oh, 10 yards, DC. The end zone is 10 yards. That is a 30-yard field goal. And truthfully, it might have been good from 32 and a half. Maybe. Maybe 32 and a half, did DC. Y'all do that? But look at my form though, RCA. <laughs> RC, you see my form whenever I get to the ball? 
Did you see that? You <laughs> thought I was in perfect position to make that kick, and I gotta yeah, be start honest. The show. They doctored the footage. Hey, start the show. Y'all know damn you well that DC would not lie. Or at least in my mind, I thought it was 47 yards. But the reality is this. Okay, let's go with that. That was one of my crowning moments. But another thing was that I did recently, RC, that was very crowning. Bro, I met Troy Palomalu. I met Troy Palomalu. You did. And Troy Palomalu <laughs> was more than anything I ever could have imagined. First off, I was like, when you guys were together at lunch, I was like, oh, my God, these guys are really friends. Because the way you talk about them, like, it's you like your it. idol. I didn't know if you guys were really friends. But, dude, he's so nice. <laughs> He's so nice. He is. How is he so nice? He is, he? man. Man, I, you know what? I, I actually told him the, the night before we were sitting down talking, and he said, hey, man, all I want to do, he's like, I want to meet Daniel Cormier. He's like, you got to do that for me. And I was like, man, DC's cool, this and this. I said, he's actually a <laughs> lot like you. I said, we think about the way that he fought, and you would think he walks around and he's angry and menacing all the time. I was like, but he's actually one of the coolest dudes I ever met. So humble, even as being a champion. I was like, he kind of reminds me of you. And so when you two were talking, I was like, this is like the softest, sweetest conversation of champions I've ever heard in my life. Two of the Bro. baddest dudes in the world, and y'all were just so polite and so kind. But it was dope, man, to get right. you know you being my friend, him being my friend, you guys to meet. RC, he told me he loved me. Literally for hours afterwards, I was thinking about it. I was like, oh, my God. Troy Paul, like I was, he literally said, love you, brother. And then, like, for an hour after, yeah. I kept going in my head, going, my goodness, I just talked to Troy Palomalu. I always viewed him as just like a killer. He was like a savage, right? Long hair, killer. And this yeah. dude is a sweetheart, bro. And then goes, he love is, you, bro. bro. I was like, this has to be one of the best days of my life. I'm not going to even lie, man. So maybe at some point I get Habib. To tell you that he loves you. But let me tell you something. You He's know never going to say that. Love? Your friends are you know way didn't... meaner than my friends. <laughs> no. You know who didn't get the love last week in RC? As I pivot? You know, Mackenzie Dern. Yao Shanan did not give her the love. She did not give her the love no. last weekend in the Apex in front of only Mark Zuckerberg and his people, which is the yeah. ultimate. That's like the ultimate, like, big dog pull <laughs> of all time to just wreck oh. the whole event. But... So Shao Nan was able to beat Mackenzie Dern when Mackenzie Dern seems to be on the upswing. What did you make of the performance, and what did you make of Yao Shanan's performance in a moment where she had her opportunity to shine? Absolutely did that. I thought Shao Nan took advantage of what she had. She had an advantage in the striking, and she was able and she was able to use that. I think whenever you look at Mackenzie Dern's opponent, their number one their number one objective has to be to stay off of the mat. And she was able to do that. I think the, the other piece of it is, DC, I'm getting to the point, you know, Mackenzie Dern has the, the four-fight win streak, and now she's two and three. I mean, now she's lost uh, two of her last three fights. I'm starting to wonder, is Mackenzie Dern as good as we thought she was early on in her career. Uh, we know that once she gets you to the matter, once she takes the fight to the ground, that she has an elite level of, of grappling and jiu-jitsu. But we've now seen her on her feet, even T uh, Tisha Torres, in which a fight that she ended up winning in a split decision, I thought she could have lost that fight as well. So as we were building her to maybe be the next big thing and be the next big time champion that becomes a star in the UFC, I'm starting to wonder if she has that level of skill and if her skills and technique on her feet have evolved enough to put her in that conversation. Because right now, DC, I'm not seeing the path or the road to an ascension into that championship spot for Mackenzie Dern. You know, I think when you, you look at the fight last weekend, and uh, RC, it's not because she's not willing. Mackenzie Dern is more than willing to stand and trade. She's very game. But the reality is, she's a grappler first. And when she is forced to stand, she gets a bit wild. She starts to loop punches. But I think what surprised me most about the fight on Saturday was Shannon's ability to not only survive when the fight hit the ground, but to operate and be effective defensively and make sure that she was never really in any danger of getting submitted. But I think that because Mackenzie Dern is so likable, because Mackenzie Dern has the look, because it's more to star building than just fighting. As you and I both know, we'll talk to a guy later uh, in Sean O'Malley, 
that has kind of figured that out, that there's more than just fighting to becoming a star. Mackenzie Dern has that thing, that it, that makes people want to pay attention. But the reality is the fighting skills have not matched up to this point. But I think what we need to really be careful of is saying what Mackenzie Dern did not do while ultimately not giving credit to Yao Shanan for what she did inside the octagon. And her coach even went on record going, she may get promoted in her jujitsu belt level because of the way that she competed on the floor in the fight this weekend. So I think that she was always good. She was always very, very good. I think this was the performance, though, that will really introduce her to really high-level competition and more of those big-name fights that she wants so bad. I mean, she was she was able... I mean, I think the, the points you made about her not just surviving the ground game with Mackenzie Dern, but actually found, finding ways to move in and out and be effective in ground and also defending Mackenzie Dern, I think that was extremely important. But it also takes us to where Mackenzie Dern needs to go, DC, if this this kind of pre-champion or this kind of ascension that I feel like the UFC had set up for is ever going to come to fruition, is ever going to be a reality. Has her game evolved enough? And do you think Mackenzie Dern can still grow as a fighter enough to where what we saw in the fifth round is more of what we see in her future or at least bring it back to her earlier fights where she was dominant in the UFC. You know what I think Mackenzie Dern needs to do, RC, is uh, she needs to go up to a place like AKA where the wrestlers can help her with the takedown transitions to allow for her to get to where she wants to be. Because if you recall all the great champions from the gym, we all had an ability to go take you down, but take you down in multiple ways. That's where she struggles. She struggles when she yeah. can't get the fight to the floor. So she needs to be in a yeah. grappling-heavy gym, but not just a grapple-heavy gym, a grapple-heavy gym with a wrestling focus. So even though it was called the mm. American Kickboxing Academy, you knew when you got Cain Velasquez, myself, Luke Rockhold, Habib Nurmagomedov, now Islam Makhachev, and so many others, Josh Koscheck, John Fitch of the old days, that were going to take you down and really ground you out. And I think that is where McKenzie needs to make the evolution because it's not for lack of will. Her willingness to strike will never fade away. She'll fight you on the feet if she has to, but I don't believe that she needs to. She needs to get to a place where they can really help her with her takedowns and not just jujitsu takedowns where she's trying to drag you to the floor, trip you, where she's actually getting legs, moving you around, yeah. man outmaneuvering you from one move to the next, that will allow for her to secure takedowns easier, and then you welcome into her world, which is the grapple. Yeah. Yeah, and I th think that's huge, what you say. Like, you could see almost how deterred she gets or or even, like, the, the, the expression on her face when her takedowns aren't working. So getting somewhere yep. that's a wrestle-heavy gym that would allow her to understand, you know, single legs and double legs, also different ways of getting the fight to the mat, that only increases her opportunities of getting people in the space that she excels in. Speaking of wrestle-heavy, uh, we had Bo Nickel on the show a couple of weeks before he had his second yeah. opportunity on the Contender Series. All he did was go show exactly what he said on this show that he can be dominant that he can submit people we've you know we've seen him strike as well with Bo Nickel earning his contract to the UFC what do you see as the future ceiling for someone as accomplished as this young man is you know Ryan I don't know if I've ever seen a better prospect in mixed martial arts especially a better prospect with that record right he's only 3 and 0 but the guy seems to be able to do everything now, for many, it's surprising, but not necessarily for me, because when you go deeper into Bo Nickel, you understand that not only is he a great wrestler, his mom had him boxing as a kid, Ryan. So when people are surprised that he's knocking people down with his hands, Bo Nickel has a boxing background. It's in the family. Okay. And then Bo Nickel right, wrestled right. at the highest level. So he can seamlessly mix these skills together and then his grappling. The way that he went from the mount into that triangle in his contender series fight last week was amazing. I didn't develop, I never developed the triangle, but I didn't develop those submission skills until years and years down the road. Bo Nickel seems to have all those things right now 
But not only does he have the skill, he has that swagger, Ryan. He has that that confidence about himself that will draw people in. And we spoke about him being on the December card. Dude's on December 10th yeah. fighting against a guy in Jamie Pickett that would seem to be a good matchup for him. And Bo Nichols said this. Mm-hmm. He goes, Ryan, if I'm on the prelims, I might as well retire. So this dude wants to be on the Whoa. pay-per-view portion <laughs> of a UFC <laughs> pay-per-view in his first fight. That's crazy. Yeah. But but I think it's not necessarily crazy, D.C., because I feel like as, as sports ha- have evolved, as social media has evolved, as fame has evolved, these young kids aren't willing, not aren't willing, they don't feel like they need to wait. Bo Nickel understands what type of draw he is. And we spoke about it as well. This is the dude that was on our show on D.C. and R.C., before he earned a UFC contract, two fights into his <laughs> professional career. And if that right there doesn't tell you the type of cachet or the type of potential and expectation that this young fighter has on him, then nothing does. You spoke about his ability to stand up because of the, the boxing background that his mother instilled in him. But he's also unequivocally, without, without a doubt, without question, one of the best young wrestlers in the entire world. When you think about what he can do and how great he is at that one aspect of his game that has UFC guys and pros right now thinking he can ragdoll some of the game's best grapplers, some of the game's best wrestlers, what is it? uh, 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 Harry Cejudo said, Shamayev thinks he's good at wrestling. His wrestling is nowhere near Bo Nickel. I can tell you that 100%, I can see Bo Nickel easily taking down Hamzat Shamayev. That's huge. For Henry Cejudo, someone who understands wrestling at the top of the game, to say something like this about Bo Nickel, what is it about his wrestling, DC, or his style of wrestling, how good he is at it, his technique, that makes someone like uh, Triple C say this? He just, he's fearless. He really is fearless out there, man. I, um, I spoke to this recently when people were asking me, Bo Nickel's freshman year, uh, sophomore year, sorry, he was undefeated. He was the man, RC. He was the guy. He went to the Big Tens and he lost in the finals of the Big Ten tournament. That would normally deter a young wrestler. He wrestled that same guy in the finals weeks later and he pinned him because that's who Bo Nickel is. Bo Nickel doesn't allow for uh, bumps in the road to really deter him or knock him off course. He's always heading down one path and that's to be in the best. And when you matched him up in just wrestling, I don't believe that Hamzat can compete with him, not just wrestling, but in mixed martial arts, that makes it a little bit more difficult to implement just a strong wrestling base. Look, I struggled taking down John Jones, even though I was a much more mm-hmm. credentialed wrestler because he was taller. There are so many factors that go into effectively wrestling someone inside the octagon. So I get okay. what Henry's saying, but I think that in time, that may be true. Today, I think that Bo Nickel still needs a little bit of work. And I think that even though the UFC won't tell you there are development fights, there are still development fights. Like in boxing, it's very clear when a guy doesn't belong inside of the ring with his opponent. That will be clear for Bo Nickel in at times. It just won't be said to you right to your face. But there will be some fights that he builds up to. Well, I think when you look at the when you look at the UFC or mixed martial arts is it's one of those sports that we starting to see guys quote unquote get fast track. Uh, we'll have an opportunity uh, to speak to Sean O'Malley and 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 and, and, and in speaking about Sean O'Malley, it's going to be some people who think he's been fast tracked to get a Piotr Jan fight. We saw Hamzat Chemaev get a Gilbert Burns, which was very fairly early in his uh, UFC career. Football is one of those sports where we don't feel like freshmen in college should be in the league, right? We don't feel like Mm -hmm. guys who are just fresh out of high school get an opportunity or could hold up physically to what the NFL provides. I think the only person I ever looked at and thought that about was Adrian Peterson. When Adrian Peterson was running at Oklahoma, I was like, he could play for the Minnesota Vikings right now as a freshman. Uh, We just saw another from the Contender Series, we just saw a 17-year-old in Rojas Jr. Why you said his name? Why you said his name, bro? Why you said his name after what he did? 
After what they showed us that it did happen to AP, bro. Now, why he got to say AP name? <laughs> After what right. Le'Veon Bell did to him. Like, why you got to? Why you bring that up? I was trying up? to keep it together. <laughs> I was trying to why keep you bring it together. That up, I was dog? trying. That, I'm sorry, listen, bro. You said his name. We're not. <laughs> we're not talking about Adrian Peterson, the boxer. Well, should be retired boxer, right? We're talking about Adrian Peterson, the Hall of Fame running back. Right? Can we get to the show, bro? We are trying to do a show about combat sports. Right? This is not a this is not a a, a stand up uh, comedy. All right. <laughs> Back to what I was saying. Aljamain Sterling said that he could see Young Rojas Jr. being a champion down the road. What do you think about a 17 year old young man earning a UFC contract and what that type of atmosphere, what that type of, of, of journey or what those type of responsibilities could be for such a young man? You know, um, you know, uh, you're a funny guy, but you know, um, so uh, for Rosas Jr., I think that I, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with anything you're saying in regards to him being young and how you guys don't allow for the young guy to go into the NFL. I think 17's a little young. I think 17's a little young for me. Because I don't, I think back to when I was 17, Ryan decision as a professional athlete as a 17 year old. It's like that, those are the questions for me that I don't think that this kid will be ready to to, to answer. Now, is he technical enough? Yes. Is he physical enough? It would seem to be that way. Does he have the skills? Absolutely. But what happens whenever this young, young man falls into some issues in terms of getting beat on? Then, you know, you'll have that section of people going, oh, he's just a kid. He's a baby. But the reality is he's making a choice. He's, he's won already six fights. I mean, I don't know how a kid has six fights at 17 years old. Uh, it, right. It, where is he fighting at? In, Mex in Mexico, they must be licensing kids at 15 years old because he's got six wins. So I'm not like saying it's a horrible, horrible thing. I just think there are a lot of things that this kid is going to need help with in terms of guidance as he goes forward in his career. You know, when I think about Raul Rosas Jr., I think about 17-year-old Ryan Clark. 17-year-old Ryan Clark was a senior at Archbishop Shaw High School. And, yeah, I was, I was mm -hmm. all state there, and I was top 12 in Louisiana, but I couldn't even start on – LSU's team the next year when I turned October, I mean, when I turned 18 in October. And so I think about the development I had to make physically, right? The, 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 the fact that I wasn't even physically ready at that point to play with kids my age or play with young men 20, 21, to be able to step into the octagon and feel like you're physically ready for that, I think is the first issue. And now you move to the emotional and mental maturity you have to have at that, at that standpoint, at that standpoint professionally or at that time as far as it pertains to training, as far as it pertains to living away from the octagon, living away from the gym. There's so much that goes into being an elite athlete. It's not just the skills mm -hmm. or the way that you could perform. So for, for Rosas Jr., it's going to be getting the right people around him to guide his career, yep. to guide his decisions, but also the UFC understanding that you're not trying to get this young man to go from 17 and be the champion at 19 and have this short-lived career. How do you build him up? Kind of what you said on those on those amateur, not amateur fights, on those build-up fights, on all those preparation fights to get him at the right time when he is peaking to be one of the faces of the UFC. Basically, don't ruin him. So when you think about the mm -hmm. part that everyone else has to play in Rosas Jr.'s career, how do you see that fitting in to his overall success? How important is that? You know, you know, you made a great point on the UFC will have to play a part more than they normally do with an athlete because they're going to have to guide this kid. And I have to imagine, RC, that when the kid was in the interview process and the kid was in the process of trying to get in the series, they saw something in him, a level of maturity that may be beyond its years to allow for them to put him in that situation. So I get it. 
I get why they're doing it. It's a great story. Obviously, it was everywhere. The kid's going into the video game now already. EA Sports UFC 4. He has drawn the attention of people. But there's going to be a lot of people that have to step up in order to guide him, at least for a few years, to make sure that not only is he developing physically but mentally inside of the UFC's octagon. This is a big, this is a big moment for the UFC and a big moment for a kid because I believe now you're going to have lifelong martial artists, kids that do everything from very young, yeah. getting in these positions. So this is the first one, but I don't anticipate this is going to be the last young kid that is UFC ready right now. Um, so big moment for the UFC and big moment for Rosas Jr. Yeah, this is a huge moment uh, for Raul Rosas, and I want it to work out. And that, that, that doesn't mean to me that he has to become a champion. That means that he has to be taken care of. I don't. You don't want to see a young kid like this put in a situation to where he's used, because I do believe this is the first of many. This is going to be a guy that sets the precedent that if you train as a youngster, you can have an opportunity to become a professional extremely early. And for him, for Rosas Jr., for the UFC, this is a good moment in time. Hey, now we go from one contender champ to one of the guys that will be contending for a belt really soon if he gets this win on the 22nd, and that is Sugar Sean O'Malley. Hey, listen, what other superstar gets his hair done on the show? What's up, bro? Busy man, RC. I'm a busy man. <laughs> hey, this boy, hey, you must be RC, extremely this busy, bro. Two. This boy got two women working on his hair. I mean, he, he is living the <laughs> life. Look at this. Sean O'Malley, you think you can like loan me a couple hairstylists so that they can they can hook your boy DC up? <laughs> what can they do with this? I feel like you can get Nothing. a nice little afro with that. <laughs> little pro. Hey, all you can do with that, DC, is get a Steve Harvey toupee. That's it. You're gonna have a, a flat top with the edge. <laughs> I got a nice pink if I get sugar a show, afro. Man, I got a nice pink sugar afro <laughs> dropping for Halloween. I'll, I'll send you one. Yeah, there hook you your go. boy up. Hook me up. <laughs> sugar, man, you know, you're getting prepared uh, for this fight. This is gonna be the biggest fight of your career. Um, you've earned this opportunity. How are you preparing yourself? for what Piotr Jan presents inside the octagon? Um, I, I feel like I'm just doing what I do every fight camp, and that's just dialing in for 12 weeks. I, I feel like uh, that, that Pedro Munoz camp was a long one. It was about 12 weeks long. The fight didn't obviously play out the way I wanted it to, but, you know, I, I got each fight camp I evolved so much, so... Uh, that, that was a long fight camp, and then I took, it was about five weeks off, and then right back into this long fight camp. So I'm, I feel like I'm extra prepared, which is, which is necessary for a guy like Piotr, Peter Jan. Hey, so Sean, when you look at the matchup and you look at the guys in the top five, you do believe that you can beat them all. And ultimately, you have to beat them all if you want to become the champion. But this guy, for as talented as he is, he's a predominant boxing-style fighter. That is your forte. Do you feel like this is the matchup for you within the top five to propel you to a title shot? I mean, I go out there and beat beat Peter. I, yeah, I get I get a title shot, and uh, it just happens to be a you know a good matchup for me. But realistically, after that Pedro fight, I I went to the UFC and said, hey, I want to book a fight. Peter Yan was the only guy in the top ten that did not have a fight book. He was the only guy, so. Uh, you know, it just it just made sense. I go out there and beat up, you know, Peter. I, I get a title shot. You know, this is a, a big jump in competition. Obviously, you didn't get the opportunity to finish the fight with Pedro Munoz, but we talked about it, whether it was here or on the pivot. You were starting to fill, fill him out and kind of land your shots. Without having that finish, without truly knowing that result, where is your confidence going into a fight against someone ranked as highly as Piotr Jan, and who is a former champion? Uh, the confidence is, as, you know, as high as it can be. I, I, uh, Pedro didn't hit me. You know, he might have kicked my legs a couple times, but 
I think that's uh, you know, a pretty silly narrative. That's that's how you just got to go out there and beat me, just kick my legs. I mean, I checked probably half the kicks he threw. Um, he didn't punch me in the face. He didn't punch me in the body once, and he's a top 10 guy. I felt very, very in control of that fight. I felt very confident in there with him. I didn't feel like I was out of my league or shouldn't have been in there with him. I felt like he felt like he shouldn't have been in there with me. I felt like he was the one trying to get out of there, mm. you know? Um, so I feel I'm very excited for the press conference. I'm excited to be around Peter because I do think that he thinks maybe he's going to intimidate me or that I am slightly scared or I'm even a little bit nervous for this fight. I can't wait to look into his eyes and him realize that not only am I ready, not only am I capable, but I, I'm just, this is my time. October 22nd, 2022 Sugar Show beats Peter Yawn. That's just what's going to happen. Mm. It's not that you're not afraid. It's your expectation. So whereas you feel like maybe he believes that you're a bit afraid of the situation, your expectation is not only to be here, but to win the fight. Now, let me ask you this question here. A couple weeks ago, you so, you spoke about the odds and how you are a underdog to Peter Yawn, and you said you're very surprised by it. Is that surprise rooted in the matchup? Because... Like I've said on air, on record, this is the ideal matchup for Sean O'Malley because he's not going to try to wrestle you the whole time. He's not going to try to stay outside. He's a guy that's going to engage you in what you do best. Do you think that because of the stylistic matchup, the odds should be more close in your opinion? I, I mean, to the to the casual, to the dummy, it, like the odds seem seem about right. But to to an expert, to a high level fighter, someone with a high level IQ, you know, I think that the odds would be a lot closer. I've heard a lot of the you know, pros talk about it. They're they're not necessarily counting me out. A lot of people do think I'm going going to lose this fight, but uh, I mean, just to obviously, I'm I'm gonna I expect to go out there and win. So you know, I'm a, I'm the favorite in my mind. But it is it is it's fun. I, I don't think I've ever been the underdog. It, it is different. It's fun. It's fun. It's, there's a little bit of extra fire uh, under under me, so it is nice. And and honestly, it's I would say I prefer being the underdog because at the end of the day, I don't really care. But it is different, and it's a uh, you know, it's a little boost. Sean, do you you said that people expect you to lose? You know, like certain people. Do you think they expect you to lose, Sean, or do you think people want you to lose because of how fast you have risen? There is a a portion of people that would go, I would like to see him put in this place, especially with this level of a jump, because there are a lot of guys in your weight class that recognize you get this done. They're going to have to be very mad because you're going to fight for the championship. So do you believe that people yeah. expect it? Or are they hoping that Sean O'Malley doesn't get the job done? Usually I'd say people are, they're hoping I don't win, but to be honest, I would say the majority of people, people that think I won't win, actually want me to win people want a superstar you know there's really no one in the ufc right now that that is that connor level me i go out there and beat peter in spectacular fashion i i can, I'm, I'm climbing i'm not going to be there yet and i know that but i'm climbing to become that guy i want to be that guy i want to be the connor i don't want it to be competitive to where it's like well you're you know you're up there with this i want to be that guy um so I, and i think the ufc fans want that they want somebody that they can get super, super excited about. Um, so I, I think more most people think I'm going to lose, but I think majority of people want me to go out there and win, which is rare. I don't usually think that, but I, I do think in this case that, that that's what it is. I was going to say that. You, that's a bit of a change from your norm. That's a bit of a change from your normal mentality in regards to people and their expectation and hopes for you. You know, like you've obviously risen to this fame in in the UFC, which is very difficult to do. I think it's the it's the style, it's the style of fighting, it's the style you have outside of the octagon, it's the way you move, the way you speak. You mentioned Conor McGregor. What propelled Conor McGregor to the superstardom was the 13 seconds against Jose Aldo. Are you looking at Piotr Jan as your Jose Aldo? That's a good question. I got asked that question the other day too by somebody and uh, the answer, you know, I don't think I have to go out there and knock Peter Yan out and, and 
very fast. I don't have to go and knock him out in under a minute to get that Jose Aldo moment. I think, you know, just beating Peter, uh, you know, I, I know how tough he is. I know how good he is. I go out there and beat Peter in a decision. I'm not going to be the most excited. I do want to finish. But beating beating Peter is going to be – is a big deal in itself. I have about, I'd say, 10 more years in this sport. So my Jose Aldo moment, my quick knockout like that, I believe could be any, you know, you, you don't go into a fight expecting to knock anyone out that fast. Uh, I would not be surprised if I did that, not to Peter, but to anybody. I believe I am capable of knocking people out that fast for sure, especially if they come in and they're not, you know, they make a mistake. But uh, th this could be a Jose Aldo moment, not necessarily as in knocking them out that fast, but a knockout in spectacular fashion over him in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, it, it could be as big as that. It's going to be a fantastic fight. I can't wait to call it. I'll be in Abu Dhabi. But if I had to guess, it will not be a fast knockout because Piotr's a bit of a counter striker. You're a smart tactical fighter yourself. So I believe there will be a little bit more of a Jose Aldo charge at Conor McGregor. I don't anticipate that Piotr Jan will be doing that against the Sugar Show, Sean O'Malley. Sean, thanks once again, my friend, for joining us, man. We appreciate it. And it was nice having you at the commentary table for the Contender Series. <laughs> And you're real good at it, man. So <laughs> keep that idea in the future yes, for sir. you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Appreciate you, Thank you, RC. Appreciate you, guys. Hey, man, Sean O'Malley always brings it. And this dude is going to look forward to bringing it in the octagon in Abu Dhabi. Biggest fight of his career. He's always so gracious with his time. We really appreciate him for it, Ryan. Oh, yeah, man. He's a dope dude, man. And anytime you have an opportunity to kick it with a guy like Sean O'Malley, it's something that you want to do. But, you know, we got some more coming up, D.C., and I think we might need to bring this guy in because he's almost stepping as fly as I do. You know what, R.C.? Last week, I was announced as the special guest referee for the Seth Rollins versus Matt Riddle inside of the fight pit. Guys, now we are joined. It's one round with the visionary, with Seth freaking Rollins. My man, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah, what up, boys? RCDC. <laughs> what Seth up, dog? In the house. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Dude, listen. So you're just finishing training, obviously. You're probably doing CrossFit somewhere in Iowa because that is what you do. But how... Excited are you about the fight this weekend? Because, listen, it's a match, but this has gotten ugly, and this is a fight. How excited are you about the fight from Philadelphia this weekend? <laughs> I am psyched, baby. We are going into the fight pit. Now, look, it is a match that I have never taken part of, but I have been in every single type of match that WWE has to offer, and I've always found a way to come out on top. So I am very much mm -hmm. looking forward to Philadelphia this Saturday. Extreme Rules, the Fight Pit, and D.C. I got you in there with me, baby. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Seth, man, you're going to right. have D.C. there with him. But the big thing is this, man. I saw kind of the, the interview that you had, and it, had, it gave me some – John Jones, Daniel Cormier vibes. Uh, did you get any inspiration from that great feud in the UFC? <laughs> uh, I, I cannot divulge my trade secrets, but we may have taken uh, a, a bit of a note from the, the old John Jones DC uh, feud. I think the only difference is, uh, well, that's not true. Riddle's an idiot as well. So John Jones is an idiot. Riddle's an idiot. It kind of all matches up, right? You know, it all matches up. <laughs> You know what, hey, Ryan, right now Seth is trying to get good favor with me for this weekend, but I cannot sit here and pretend that I'm going to help this guy. But here's the question now, Mr. Wait, Rollins. Wait, 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 wait a minute. This. What are you talking about? Uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. Hey, uh -oh. I saw you guys last night on Raw, and I had, to I, had to in I had to interrupt you two from arguing like petulant children to tell you to calm down. <laughs> I am going there for a job. Seth Rollins, I am there for a job. I am not there as a fan. If I wanted to be a fan, Seth, I would sit in the stands like oh. I did when you won the championship in Santa Clara. So I will be fair. I will be right down the middle, and I'm going to do a job. So for everything else, <laughs> it's out the window. So you better be okay, ready for wink, a fair wink. fight. Don't think that I'm going out there to help you. Wink, wink, nudge, He's nudge, wink. right? He's wink, 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 nudge, nudge. Okay. He's going, <laughs> going for a job, right, R.C.? 
Come on now. Come on. I'm not that stupid, DC. I know we go way back. Look, you and Riddle both in the fight game and all that. But look, you're a fan, man. I know you're in there. You got to have my back, right? Come on. You got to have my back. No, 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 no. Forget that. I was not paid to do that, RC. Now, listen, let me ask you a question, Seth. I watch you every week, Mr. Monday Night, doing your thing out there, really captivating the crowd and really catching them and holding them in the palm of your hands. For a long time, and that is why I was such a big fan of your work earlier, was that people kind of wanted to get behind you. But it seems like now you're competing at a level that I've never even seen you compete before while not holding a championship. Like, how exciting is this time in your career? Well, look, uh, I'm gonna. I'm just going to go past, you know, you trying to say that you're going to be impartial here and, and kind of put my back against the wall. And I'm going to talk about me because you're right. I am at the top of my game right now. I am in my prime. I'm 36 years young, baby. I am feeling good. And the most important part, the most important part is that I am as sharp as I've ever been right here. And that's what matters most, baby. So it doesn't matter if I'm getting title opportunities. It doesn't matter if Roman Reigns doesn't want to show up, if he's ducking and dodging me. It doesn't matter. I'm the champion in my heart. I'm the champion in the people's hearts. And baby, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started, DC. <laughs> hey, Seth, man, listen, we're gonna we're gonna ignore DC, man. I know he's trying to put your back in the wall. He's making against the wall. He's <laughs> making it seem like it's two against one, but it's actually not, bro. Because I'm on your side, and here's why. Here's why I'm on your yeah. side. Though. I've been checking out some of these outfits that you wear, man, on fight night because that's just what we're talking about, and you stay clean. So I want to get into a little step and fly and talk about something that you Ooh. wore at WrestleMania. Bro, I don't know what it was. What is, was it the blue lace whip? It was like a baby peacock outfit, man. Tell us a little bit about your inspiration <laughs> when, you get your, when you get your outfits ready, man, to go out there, entertain, and show the world what you are. I mean, look, it starts up here with a little germ of an idea. I got a whole team. I got a stylist. His name's King Troy. You can find him on Instagram. I got a guy that does my gear. His name is Mikazi. I am Mikazi Saratan on Instagram. And these boys, they keep me looking fresh. They keep me looking fly. We work together. It is a beautiful synergy. And what you see, <laughs> the final outcome is the absolute drippiest of the drip, my friend. Nobody, not even you, RC, <laughs> as much as you might try, hey, we got can touch me. We got one department. more for you. Seth, I got I got one more for you, man, because you do too much to get just one. Hey, this joint with the wings, yeah. this is like something off of the series <laughs> Lucifer, man. Tell me about this. <laughs> rocket man, burning up the grass. He's a rocket man. That's me, baby. Look, we are over in Cardiff, Wales, Clash of the Castle. First huge pay-per-view uh, on UK soil in a long time. I got to pay tribute to the great. Elton John, Sir Elton John, thank you very much. Amazing fit. Got the inspiration from the film Rocket Man, and oh, mm, I must say I owned it. It looked really good, ultimately, but guess what? You got a fight this weekend, and Matt Riddle has 12 UFC fights inside of an octagon, so the fight pit is home to Matt Riddle, Seth. So for as good as you look, how do you plan to compete in this type of situation, this is a difference. And Riddle's had these fights in NXT before. So this is new to you, but this is very familiar to Riddle. Yeah, I got to admit, uh, you know, Riddle and I, we've gone back and forth for a long time. Uh, I don't got a lot of respect for the guy personally, um, but professionally, uh, he can go. He really can go. And, and this is his type of match. This is his domain. He's got the experience in there that I don't have. But like I said, there's one thing that I've got that he's never going to have, and that is a mental acumen for the fight game. He's been doing this mm. for a while. I've been doing this my entire adult life. And so when it comes to stepping inside of a cage, I've been in cages before. I've been in hell in a cell before. I understand the rules are a little bit different inside the fight pit. But as they say, where there is a will, there is a way. And my friend, I don't like to lose. So I'm going to figure it out. And whether you want to help me or not, whether you're going to be on my side or not, I'm going to get the job done. I'm going to beat Riddle, and then I'm moving on. You know, Ryan, they call him the visionary. So he can see what yeah. he wants to do on this Saturday, streaming live on Peacock. Watch Extreme Rules, guys. Seth Rollins will fight Matt Riddle yeah. in the fight pit live from Philadelphia. Once again, that's on Peacock. Subscribe. 
hit the buy button and watch me as I lay down the law. Johnny Law is showing up in Philly this weekend, <laughs> hey, and Seth Rollins they just let show anybody some do it. To Daniel Cormier. <laughs> Look, you want to, all right, DC, you show up, you lay down the law, but I'm telling you, if you get too close, if you start, start pushing the boundaries, you get in my way. I'm not afraid to, to put hands on you. I'm just saying, I don't want it to oh go there. I don't want it to go there. <laughs> You're retired. You're past your prime. Hey. I'm in my prime. So do not step in my face. Understand? You mind your business. You do things as they need to be done down the line. But I swear wow. to God, if you touch me, I will knock you out. I don't. I didn't want to go there with he, it, but that's where it's hey. got to be. Hey, no, that's listen, he's talking hey, to you Mr. like Wallace. John Jones, DC. Hey, 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 yeah, he's talking to me like that. He's out of his mind, Ryan. But guess what, Seth, guess what? <laughs> Because you talk to me like that, you just made Ryan Clark buy the pay-per-view. You just sold one pay-per-view because yeah, Ryan Clark is did. I got to see it. I hope we put hands on you, DC. Hey, RC, I hope we put hands on you, Philly, baby. I'll put you in a rep shirt. You can hang out too, baby. Let's go. Hey, let's get my it, my man. man. Thank Best you of for luck joining this us, week, bro. man. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Ryan, that was the visionary Seth Rollins. Look, man, I'm excited about being inside of the fight pit with these dudes this weekend. But I don't know if this guy's trying to plant the seed for me cheating for him. He also said he would knock me out and you. Dude invited you to Philadelphia to get knocked out no, too, RC. No, DC, he did not say he was going to knock me out. He said he was going to put hands on you. He said I could come and be a part of the event because I was on his side. See, people, the one thing that happens, people don't come here and play with me like that, DC. They understand the difference between you and I is this. They put hands on you, they got to fight you. They put hands on me, I'm <laughs> suing, right? Straight up. There's a difference <laughs> in what we do, dog. So they don't want to lose their money. For I do, hey, DC, I do TV. I do not fight, so I don't want no <laughs> smoke. Man, listen, man, we got to get the tap in, tap out, man. You know what time it is, dog. Let's get it going. Recently, Hamzat Shemaev tweeted out that Colby Covington was next. Colby does not have a fight lined up, and Hamzat always wants to fight the best of the best. DC, tap in or tap out on Hamzat versus Covington? I tap in. I, I tap all the way in on this fight. I believe that it's confusing a bit because Hamzat uh, was saying 185 a couple weeks ago. We thought the UFC was going to bump him up to 185. So confusing, but I'm all in because I believe that Colby Covington's skill set is the skill set that could present Hamzat with his toughest challenge because he has the wrestling, he has the cardio, and as he's shown in the last couple Usman fights, he has the stand-up to fight the best in the world. So, yeah, I tap in. Yeah, I tap all the way in, and this seems like the natural progression. You know, we got an opportunity to see him fight Gilbert Burns. Obviously, the fight against Kevin Holland didn't necessarily show much, but this is the next step we need to see. And then if we do get the Usman rematch or whatever's next for the champion, Leon Edwards, this lines up that Hamzat Shmaev, if he does win, gets that next opportunity. All right, guys, over the weekend, Dana White posted a photo of his new physique. Also, recently, Conor McGregor posted how he has bulked up recently as well. So, RC, tap in or tap out. Dana's physique is more impressive than Conor's. Well, I, I, I tap in that neither of these physiques is more impressive than Daniel Cormier's. Let's start right there yeah, and yeah, be yeah, sure yeah, that yeah, everyone yeah. knows that. Like, that's the first thing. Yeah. Um, I think, honestly, it's Dana White because I remember early Dana. Early Dana was skinny. Early Dana didn't look anything like this. And this is a man that's now in his 50s that's training probably more than he's ever trained in his life. And he actually now looks like the dude that should run the UFC. So I tap in on Dana's <laughs> physique more impressive than Connor. Yeah, I, I gotta agree with you, Ryan. I, I mean, Connor is still young. Connor's fit. Connor can do all that extra work to look like he looks. Looks phenomenal, by the way. But I gotta go Dana White, man. Dana White is, he's 55 years old, RC. Hey, Dana went and did some stuff the other day where somebody told him that he got 10 years to live. He took he took that prediction very seriously if he looks like that now. Because he's like, yo, I'm not going nowhere in 10 years. I'm going to get everything yeah. right if I'm going to. Uh, he's 55, I think, or 53. He's 53 years old now. So, man, mid-50s, Dana White, Corporate Jake. Guys, last show, we showcased Alex Pereira with a bow and arrow. Well, he's back at it again, this time sparring while on a hoverboard. So, DC, tap in or tap out on Pereira training like this with only a month out from his next fight. So I tap out because what if he falls? 
but I also tap yep. in. It's like it's a weird situation where you tap both ways because that's pretty impressive because I've tried to ride a hoverboard. Those things are insanely <laughs> dangerous. You saw what happened to Mike Tyson when he got on that hoverboard. Mike almost killed himself, man. Poor Mike. Dude, it's hard to ride that thing. So I tap in on it's very impressive. I tap out on the dangers of him maybe hurting himself. No, listen, I kind of have to agree with DC. This is both of them, right? If he, Like, I can't ride a hoverboard, hoverboard just around my house, so I couldn't imagine, imagine sparring on one. But if he falls, hits his head, puts himself in a compromising position, now you have one of the biggest fights in UFC history that has to be postponed or is thrown off in some sort of way. But then I tap in just because it's really dang cool. And so Alex Pereira <laughs> has been really big into what we've done and tap in, tap out the last couple of weeks. All right, guys, lastly, another craze took over the internet recently. Car jitsu. Two competitors sitting next to each other oh, in a car on, going man. at it. RC, tap in or tap oh, out on car on, jitsu. Man. I tap so far out on car jitsu. Why are people so dang bored, bro? Like, what are you doing? Weird, like, man. where do you... Where do you get this idea? Is it and, and whose car are we jujitsuing in? Right? Like I don't want your sweaty <laughs> tail all over my car. And then I if I'm jujitsuing, I don't want to jitsu jujitsu in a car from the junkyard. Look, this look, is look, look, absolutely look, look. ridiculous. This is something and he about to go to sleep. This is something DC would do though. And honestly, let's call it what it is, y'all. It's a bar fight. That's what it is. Yeah. It's a bar fight outside of a club. RC, look, 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 look. Look at the very beginning, RC. When they start the clip again, they, it looked like they kissing. It actually looked like they was kissing in the, look, look, in the front seat of the car. I thought that, I, look right here. I thought they was kissing that first, but I didn't know what I was watching. I'm tapping out on car jitsu because it looked like he got the seatbelt on still. He still got his seatbelt on. How's that not unfair to the guy in the seatbelt? He winning though. He beat the dude that's not in the seatbelt. It's pretty entertaining when you look at it, but... I'm tapping out, man. I'm no. done with that. Corporate Jake, y'all yeah. find weirder and weirder stuff every single week, and I love it. ARC, look, man, every week we are here on YouTube, now on ESPN2, Midnight Eastern. But my brother, I got to be honest, the work that y'all doing right now on NFL Live with that telestrator is next level. Bro, add more seconds. I hey, appreciate what it. What you and Arlovsky are doing <laughs> right now, no, what you and Arlovsky are doing right now is insane. And I also saw you on the pivot with Roman Harper, and y'all kind of look alike. You and Roman Harper look like brothers, hey, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> y'all kind of look like hey, brothers, you and Roman Harper. Hey. Hey, it's all good, man. Listen, y'all make sure y'all keep tapping in with us. We're having a great time bringing you this show weekly. Remember, man, on YouTube, anywhere you get your podcast, ESPN2 at 12 Eastern. I am RC. That is DC. He didn't forget to add me at the start of the show this time, so I guess it's both of our shows for one more week. We're going to holler at y'all.